Well, it's been an interesting 10 days for Russian spaceflight. The Russians have finally gotten their Nauka module docked to the International Space Station, but not without several trials and tribulations along the way. In today's video, I want to take a look at the issues surrounding the Nauka module, and also the state of the Russian Space Agency, which I can assure you is not a good one. Nauka was originally called FGB-2, the backup for the Zarya module, but when Zarya launched and was perfectly fine in orbit, it was halted at 70% construction, and so it remained for almost a decade. Russia during the 90s was a lot of things, but one thing it wasn't was economically stable, and its space program was no different. Energia, for example, which had built the Buran just a decade ago, was forced to build water purifiers and vacuum cleaners just to stay alive. But in 2004, when Russia started to get back on its feet again, it was decided that the Nauka ISS module would be constructed based on the FGB-2. It was announced in 2005 that Europe would contribute the European robotic arm, an international partnership which kind of ensured that Nauka would be completed. The question was just when. And you'll also notice that most projects of Russia's space program in the 1990s and 2000s have been cooperative partnerships, and this isn't out of any goodwill. The Russians needed partners to subsidize their space program. That's actually part of the reason why the US bought Russian-built engines for the Atlas V and Antares. The US didn't do this just to foster cooperation with Russia, but to keep rocket scientists in Russia employed so they wouldn't take their services to Iran or North Korea, and build better ballistic missiles for them. But whatever the motivations, it was officially decided that Nauka would launch in 2007. This was pushed back to 2008, then 2009, then 2013, then 2014, and that's where the juicy stuff starts. Just a year before it was slated to launch, Nauka was going final testing, when it was discovered that there was metal dust inside of the propulsion system. This occurred because they were rerouting fuel lines in order to accommodate the European robotic arm and to switch the design of the module from a copy of Zarya to another part of the Russian segment of the space station. And there's a little bit of a legend at GK and PT Khrunichev that the workers who were sawing off the pipelines from the module thought they were dismantling Nauka for scrap, which coincidentally is almost what happened after they discovered the metal dust. The metal dust was going to require a complete overhaul of the system and a thorough cleaning. And to make matters worse, the European Space Agency, after hearing this, just decided that it was just too much for them to handle, and they pulled out of funding for the Nauka module. This meant that the Russian government would have to pick up the whole tab from then on. After multiple studies discussing the potential of just abandoning the Nauka project and continuing on without it, the Russians just decided they better finish this thing and get it launched, and they set a new launch date of 2017 to 2018. Now in 2016, work was stalled because the military certification authority that had to approve work on the propulsion section just wouldn't give their certification to move forward with work. Now this wasn't because of any engineering reason, it was just because they had a political problem with the space industry leadership. But in 2016, work was eventually resumed, and things were looking good for a launch in 2017. Until inspectors looking at the main propellant tanks found tons of, guess what, metal sawdust. This sawdust was inside everything in the spacecraft. And to add insult to injury, the tanks were designed decades ago, and there simply wasn't the production tooling in order to restart production for Nauka's tanks. Therefore, the Russians had to basically jury-rig a new set of tanks for Nauka because it was deemed too hard to actually clean the tanks that were originally installed without damaging their design and rendering them more expensive than just replacing them. So after looking at everything from progress fuel tanks to backup fuel tanks for the FGB-2 module that were all different sizes, they eventually went with the backup option of using the old FGB-2 tanks. The thing is, when they inspected these tanks, they realized there was nothing but metal sawdust in them, visible to the naked eye from 700 to 1300 micrometers. At one point, it was considered to just ignore the metal problem entirely and just install filters on the fuel lines and hope that sorted the issue out. But of course, it was pointed out that there were so many metal particles inside the fuel system that they would actually clog up the filters and leave them inoperable. So then it was decided that they would just use the original tanks and clean them out. 
This required engineers to basically cut open the fuel tanks and expose the interior, which then exposed corrosion because in the Energomash facility where the module was being stored for 20 years, humidity wasn't exactly climate controlled, and it went above 80% on multiple but relatively few occasions. This meant that now they wouldn't just have to do surgery on their fuel tanks, they would also have to restore them in order to make sure they didn't crumble waiting for launch. And in a break of good news, GNKPT Khrunichev workers working three shifts a day, seven days a week, managed to actually ship the launch date forward from 2019 to 2018, but this was of course not to be. After building a huge 7 meter tall washing machine robot to clean the original tanks, the first test of disassembling, washing, and then reassembling a prototype tank went completely wrong and there were leaks discovered in the aftermath. This forced engineers to go back to the drawing board and for Russian space leadership to consider using Fregat upper stage tanks as a replacement for the original tanks. But eventually the method for cleaning the tanks was established and the original tanks were repaired and largely cleaned. So by December of 2017, the module was looking pretty good. The rest of the work was completed by March 2018, and the module was shipped to Baikonur on the 15th of March 2018. Nah, I'm just kidding, they found more metal dust in it. This led Roscosmos to basically abandon the original tanks, and go with a design that was 90% similar to the Fregat upper stage tanks. This of course was later abandoned in 2019 after a lot of work was put into it, delaying the launch of Nauka further. But this meant the original tanks were good to go, so there was really nothing in between them and launch, right? Well, of course, there was the fact that the module was over two decades old, which meant that, I kid you not, the warranties had expired on most of the parts, which required additional certification testing that delayed the launch into 2021. Now, the Proton rocket that was meant to launch Nauka was sent to Kazakhstan, where it completed acceptance testing. But of course, if metal shavings weren't enough, the fates had a pandemic in store for the Nauka module. But despite the pandemic, crews worked around the clock to complete acceptance testing for the module, including a one-month stay in a vacuum chamber. This meant everything was looking good, and on the 15th of January 2021, all docking hatches were installed, and the micrometeorite armor and radiators were placed on the hull. It was reported that Nauka had reached 80% completion. And by the 30th of June 2021, Nauka was finally ready for launch. Fueling had begun, but a problem was again detected, this time with the guidance sensors. Some time was taken in order to readdress the issue, when it was discovered that thermal blankets covering a star tracker had not just simply been forgotten, but hadn't been manufactured at all. This led to a mad dash to find thermal blankets to cover it up, fueling continued, the MLM Nauka module was then integrated into the fairing attached to the Proton rocket, and on the 21st of July 2021, the Proton rocket carrying the Nauka module finally lifted off from Baikonur Cosmodrome after a decades-long journey. But the journey wasn't done yet. Nauka still had to make it to the space station. And if you've been paying attention these last couple days, you know that was another mission. Shortly after launch, issues were discovered with the main propulsion system. And the Nauka module was launched into a low enough orbit that it only had 30 stable orbits left before it deorbited. This led to a mad dash, I'm sure, at mission control, which tried to diagnose the problem and find a solution. Initial reports were that a high pressure event caused the bellows which keep the fuel under pressure in the main tanks, had failed. This meant that the fuel was no longer under such a high pressure, and this loss of pressure meant that the main engines were practically inoperational. This meant that the orbit raising of Nauka would have to depend on its auxiliary thrusters, and so it did. Over the nine days till docking, arduous burns with the secondary thrusters were undertaken, and eventually it reached a rendezvous with the ISS. This was despite issues that arose with the Kurtz automated rendezvous system that would have required a rendezvous be completed manually. Luckily, this was not the case and the module docked autonomously. Docking occurred at 9.29 a.m. Eastern Time and all things were going well. Congratulations were being spread across the internet, only to be cut short by loss of attitude control alarms 
at 12.34 p.m. Astronauts reported seeing particles flying around the Nauka module, and thruster firings were obviously still occurring. The current theory is that the spacecraft never switched out of docking mode, but whatever the case, the gyroscopes that control ISS movements were quickly overwhelmed, and then Zarya was then enlisted with its thrusters in order to maintain attitude. This was a losing battle until eventually the Nauka module ran out of propellant, and the Zvezda service module, along with a Progress spacecraft that was also enlisted, eventually managed to return attitude control, ending the attitude control alarms at 12.55 p.m. For now, though, it seems no damage has been done to the space station, and further structural analysis and observation will be done to ensure the station is in good health. But it's important to note that a station emergency was declared, and that the station was rotating at half a degree per second, which is pretty dang fast considering the station's about the size of a football field, and rotations could easily damage the solar panels and radiators, which would be an absolute shame considering the new rollout solar arrays were just delivered. But I want to get into the root causes behind such an issue. I mean, Nauka has faced issues from day one, really. And I think it's a great case study on just the state of the Russian space program. I mean, just when you look at their ISS operations, they've been absolutely mired with issues. Technicians have drilled a hole in a Soyuz spacecraft from the inside. There was a persistent leak in the Zvezda module. The Soyuz MS-10 mission actually failed, and a launch abort tower had to be activated in order to save the lives of, th of the crew. And now we have Nauka, which put the lives of astronauts on board in peril, especially Thomas Pesquet, who is absolutely hilarious, and it would have been a shame if he died because of Nauka. The Russian space program has been running on $2 billion a year. When you consider that Congress's latest appropriation is something like $25 billion for NASA, you can start to imagine how much of a shoestring budget Russia is on. The fact that the Russian economy is roughly the size of Italy means that even though they spend a higher proportion of their GDP on space than the US, it still comes out to only $2 billion. And unlike other space programs, the Russian space program has tons of obligations they have to maintaining their side of the space station. So it's no wonder that we've seen so many failures in the space program recently. Things where you even start to believe that the workers at Khrunichev actually thought they were dismantling the spacecraft. Conditions are horrible at many of the contractors working for Roscosmos, and the Russian version of the Government Accountability Office found that over 40% of violations in ethical conduct happened at Roscosmos. In the building of the Vostochny Cosmodrome, it was found that over $150 million was embezzled from the Russian government over the course of a few short years, and that's out of an operating budget of only $2 billion, so these losses are super important. I mean, when you're trying to run a space agency, you just can't afford to have high-level members fleeing the country because they've stolen money from your government. So when I hear talk of Russia building a new orbital space station, or finally building Yenisei, I look at how they've handled the construction of just one module, and I just can't help but laugh. It's seriously depressing how far the Russian space program has fallen, from the days of Yuri Gagarin and Energia and the N1. And it's a sad truth, but I think it's a truth that Russia needs to face. They're spending over half of their budget on maintaining human spaceflight, which is a way higher proportion than basically any other space program. So when you take a look at all that stuff going on behind the scenes at Roscosmos, it's not too incredible to look at the story of Nauka and realize it's just the product of a broken system. And it's a system that I think needs a complete overhaul from education to working conditions at Russian space factories, to political goals, and Rogozin not fanning the flames on Twitter and doing all the stupid stuff we know and love him for but for actually working to better Russia's future in space through cooperation and not, you know, thick-headed statements like, you know, we're going to build our own space station. They're not going to build their own space station. And they'll honestly be lucky if they can keep pace with China in the International Lunar Research Station. The Russians opened up space for all of us with the launch of Yuri Gagarin and Sputnik and were the first to prove that humans could live in space. We owe a debt of gratitude to all of them. And although it was admittedly funny reading about Nauka's various problems, I really do hope Russia can at least regain some of that legacy and help bring us together into the 21st century. With that, I'm Cosplus Content.
signing off.